Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, how many cities have you been to in your life? Oh, too many. Too many? Uh, did you ever find that some of them might be, I don't know, maybe foggy or, you know, misty in, in some way? Brumis? Sure. Yes. <laughs> anyway, good news. Uh, we are going to be talking about a very specific city of mist. And to do so, we have the man who created a game called City of Mist. Amit Moshe. Amit, thank you for being on. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I have heard so many people talking about City of Mist over, over the last year or so. Did you think it would have that kind of impact? It really feels like everyone is, is talking about it now. Uh, well, I'm very happy to hear that. I was hoping it would, we would have this kind of impact, <laughs> definitely, when I created it. And, uh, you know, the way we kind of played it, it was definitely, we were definitely aiming at creating this kind of impact. It's a very special game, obviously, personally, to me, because I created it. But I think also for the feedback that we've been getting uh, from people. So, yeah, this was the the plan all along and i'm happy it's working out <laughs> so. yeah it certainly seems like it is um now uh as being the novice that i am uh I'm, I'm not real familiar with like the setting i mean i can assume that it's set in a city and there is mist involved but could very could you, astute. you could be a detective <laughs> yeah, boy, don't give him any uh <laughs> any encouragement there really quick question as nathan's about to ask you to tell us about it yeah. Does this take place on the Isle of Mist? <laughs> the Isle of Because there's there's a there's a video game series yeah. about that. So I'm just checking. Oh my god. We had a massive mass before I go into City Mist, I will say that we had a originally we wrote Mist with a Y because it's a mystery and mystical and yes. a lot of different things. And then everyone was like, Don't do that. <laughs> they're like no 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 there's a whole wormhole of things and reasons why you don't want to do that yeah so to be fair uh, mist is a great game but this is not that game no city of mist is really noir uh it's kind of a noir slash graphic novel game so it's com comic book noir kind of game where you play ordinary people with legendary powers. So basically people in this city wake up one day and discover that a legend uh, is kind of incarnated in them. So we have anything. It could be uh, Alice in Wonderland, King Arthur, ancient Egyptian gods, whatever. And these legends are appearing inside ordinary people. You know, the plumber, the uh, detective, the um, you know executive. So you play these uh, characters. And the whole premise is that the city has uh, is under some kind of a spell or a mystical barrier called the mist or a veil that hides the activity of legendary powers from the sleeping or sleepwalking residents, the people who have not awakened to their legend, also known as sleepers. And uh, so you operate in this city that looks completely normal. You know, it's a modern day city. Everybody's living out their lives. Where actually behind the scenes, there is a hidden um, underworld of crime and magic and legends, uh, where they clash to try to get their, you know, promote their agendas, whether it's their human or their legendary agenda. And there's a whole bunch of things going on there. Not to mention the, you know, the powers that are kind of um, running the mist or maintaining the mist. The the kind of evil organization that's kind of doing that so are they are they really so evil if they're shrouding activities aren't they just like the reverse of the nsa uh that's a good point because nothing is really black and white in uh in city of mist because it's uh it, you know it takes from noir um comic book stuff like you can think of jessica jones you can think of uh maybe bits of fables and um especially um the telltale game um the wolf among us if you ever yes, played it i have so yeah. these kind of like detective but with superpowers or with uh supernatural powers and here it also gets a little bit of a mystical uh, twist to it so because because it takes after all these um um examples the the morality is never you know 
a black and white clear cut kind of thing. It's all very gray. Everybody has an agenda. Everybody promotes their agenda. And also uh, the people behind the mist are promoting a very clear agenda that's actually important for the city. But of course, on the way, they do a lot of uh, kind of government style, scary stuff. So... Oh. Okay. Yeah, I I don't like government uh, style scary sc uh, stuff. It, it terrifies me. Well, <laughs> oh no. Uh, so yeah. So um, you will definitely not like the gatekeepers when you meet them on your next game. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's never good when they call themselves gatekeepers. <laughs> I, feel, I know. It's I just. <laughs> slippery slope from there but yeah so you you actually play i mean in the basic form of the game in the core book you play rifts so people who have awakened to their legendary powers and uh, who have questions about their powers about what's going on in the city and um often this group your group of rifts called crew is kind of like revolves around some kind of, there, there are multiple options, right? But it revolves around some kind of mutual agenda. So either you're a group of vigilantes fighting crime or you are a group of professionals for hire, you know, guns for hire or muscle. Uh, you could be just a bunch of um, friends from high school or, or something like that or from college who are, you know, kind of like thrown into this world of magic and, and crime. So that's uh, pretty much a premise. So it's sort of like if if I were to try and you know go with something that I used. You mentioned fables, so like Wolf Among Us, that kind of thing. But if I were to take kind of that, but instead of like um, fairy tale characters, and take more historical characters, and kind of put that onto it, transpose it, I'd be I'd be somewhat there to the setting. Well, no, it doesn't have to be historical settings. It could be anything. It could be myths. Legends, fairy tales, folk tales, uh, more modern stories. We have character based on uh, Moby Dick and Don Quixote and all these um, all these characters. So uh, it's it's really like stories coming to life in a modern city oh, um, nice. through ordinary people. These legendary powers. What what causes these to um, appear? So every this is a mystery that and it's kind of left open for um for every group to kind of figure it out in in your game. Um we're going to be touching on that in some of the expansions we're planning, but generally your character has a mythos, which is that legend that is going um kind of like entering reality through you. You're the you're the gateway. You're a rift in the mist. You're basically the tear in the mist through which that uh, mythos is coming into existence. And this mythos wants to tell its story. And it's doing it through you. So it kind of pushes you in that direction. All mythoi do that. So you get, a, you get a city full of different legends trying to tell their story and kind of connecting with other legends. And of course, some of, some of the people are more awakened. Some of them are less awakened. So the more you let the legendary kind of grow in you, the more you become an instrument in its um, path or journey to tell its story. And uh, the game mechanics also support a lot of that conflict of ordinary versus legendary. You're, this balance constantly shifts in your character. You actually lose some aspects of you when you become more legendary. You lose ordinary aspects when you become more legendary. And you lose legendary aspects when you return to the ordinary. And uh, you can actually go overboard in each direction. You can become a sleeper again, and you can also become um, an avatar who's someone who completely yielded to the legendary, you know, aspect in them. So there's a lot of that kind of, you know, flexibility and, and very much like character centric uh, storytelling aspect to it that is also backed by the mechanics. So here's the real question. Why would anyone want to be ordinary? <laughs> There's a couple of things. First of all, it's it's a threat, and it's something that could, you know, if you don't want to become ordinary, then you will do a lot of things so that it doesn't happen to you in the game. Secondly, it's a really nice, um, it's actually, the ordinary really balances the legendary in that it gives more texture to your character. So it's your life. It's your, your, your I don't know if your character has a family or children or a loved one or um, a job or a mission. And are you really willing to sacrifice, sacrifice all these things to become more legendary? Mm. And so I think the the ordinary aspect really gives all the 
you know, all the texture to this uh, to this setting. Uh, so sometimes I've seen players that want to say, yeah, my, my character is, she's done with this legendary stuff. You know how superheroes do that sometimes? They're like, I don't want this anymore. I'm letting everything go. And so you can play that in the game and there are rules for that and rules for how your friends can kind of bring you back from that as well. So this is all very much inspired by comic books and, and graphic novels. I mean, right. it makes me think of Kratos because he became legendary mm. and gave up his family. Well, he killed his family. Uh, to attain all that, <laughs> and then tried to give it up, and they're like, no, so he tried to kill himself. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe not quite the parallel you're looking for, but, you know. <laughs> no, it's definitely, that is definitely that dramatic thing, that kind of dramatic developments. The system is really built around, other than all the, you know, the the combat and all that kind of stuff and, and the investigation, the system is really built around um, creating possibilities for dramatic developments in the characters' lives. So you gain themes, you, you lose themes, your character is changing, uh, you sacrifice some of your powers or you make a sacrifice in order to attain a certain goal. Like uh, whenever you use, we have a move called stop holding back. So you, you're able to use your powers at a really crazy level, but you make very big sacrifices to do that. So it's all about really creating a story because I feel, you know, I feel that this is becoming more and more uh, something people are looking for, you know, systems that are supporting interesting story development and kind of make them happen rather than a system that just like tells me what I'm able to do, but it doesn't promote the story, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I get you. Uh, yeah. And I kind of like the idea that, you know, that you, you do have something to lose, that there's like a give and take. So like I could be me, but then if like I'm also Don Quixote, you know, I have to give up my like video game time so that I can go and chase windmills. I might not like that bargain. Exactly. I got to I got to rectify this in my head. That would actually not be a great character to end up being. <laughs> Don Quixote would not be a great character to end up in body. You, you could be the legendary uh legendary Leroy Jenkins if you prefer anything. That that would be m more useful. <laughs> can tell you that um so city of mist is is a noir but it is still set in the modern day definitely yeah it's kind of i guess technically it's a neo-noir um it's it's noir with color <laughs> so a, a neon noir Ooh. it's also neon and noir i said neo <laughs> but it's also very neon noir certainly uh our kickstarter now and our story arc book um knights of pain town is very neon noir so it's so. a neo neon noir exactly triple n <laughs> get that alliteration down exactly <laughs> always so it's a detective story with uh with superpowers basically that, I, I i really like the idea of that whole setting let's uh let's head back for a little bit let's go to the way back machine for a second and uh and talk sure. about the the actual uh point where you really started working on the game. What was your inspiration to create this kind of setting in the first place? Uh, well, the setting existed for a while, and then we create. Um, I created the game for it, but the setting existed for a while. Yeah, I guess. I mean, the point that really um, that really inspired me to create it was a really specific moment in time. I was actually in Jerusalem at the time, and it's a city that very much mixes the old and the new. You can walk in a city block and suddenly have a mausoleum from, I don't know, 2,000 years ago, and you, you can see where it's going. So I was walking there at night, and I, I hear, you know, sirens and things that are very, and dogs barking, very much a city thing. But I'm standing next to this mausoleum, and uh, it's it's really old, <laughs> and there's definitely that mix of, um, you know, myth and modern modernity i guess and that was where i kind of started thinking mm, that'd be interesting i mean i would i would really love to create something that's um kind of playing on that mystery and where there is really a, a world hidden within our own world so that was kind of the origin of where it started and how long ago was that this was in 2005 so i've we've played this for like 10 years before uh we start i mean in different campaigns and not uh consecutive 10 years uh, but I played in this setting for a while before I decided to turn it into a game. Oh, I get you. 
it's it's interesting to see like the old uh next to the new I feel like it would be a little jarring if I was like next to the Arc de Triomphe and there was a Starbucks next to it and you're just <laughs> going back between the there two. There you go. Yeah, there probably but... is one next to it, but you know. Sure. We'll slide, <laughs> we'll slide past that. There's a Starbucks next to everything. There's one in the arch. <laughs> <laughs> sure. That that would be that would actually be really interesting if you could get your coffee at the top of the arch. That's that's a very neon war <laughs> thing too. Totally. When when you originally started working on City of Mist as a game, yeah, what 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 did you want to use for mechanics to really drive that that story, really drive that uh, mechanically? Uh, yeah, so I definitely I'm a big fan of Powered by the Apocalypse, like Dungeon World and Apocalypse World and a uh, bunch of other games. Um, I think it's great for driving the story, propelling it forward, and especially because. I don't know if you know the the system, but it, it's basically rolling two d six and adding a modifier, and you always look at the results. You know, you judge them by the same categories. Six or less is a miss, but a miss isn't just a miss. It always means that the MC or the GM gets to introduce a new complication, a severe complication. Uh, then seven to nine is a mix of uh, like it's a weak success. It's usually some good things mixed with some complications and 10 or more is a great success. And um, the different moves, the, the, what's beautiful about Apocalypse World is that the moves are uh, built to create a certain genre, to push the story in a certain direction. So you would have in Dungeon World, you have you know, basically Dungeon World is the D&D version of um, Apocalypse World. So you would have moves that are similar to D&D, right? And uh, in other games, you have moves that they basically capture the tropes or the essence of the actions of the genre. So mm. in City of Mist, you have Investigate. You have Hit With All You've Got. That's basically your way to punch the living daylights out of someone. You have Stop Holding Back. You have all kinds of moves that are built to create the story. So I really love the Apocalypse World and I was going to use it. The only problem with that is that superheroes in Apocalypse World don't really go very well because Apocalypse is very structured. You have a finite na- number of moves and you can't really mm-hmm. create, you know, a lot of variety in the superpowers. So this is where we added tags or I added tags. So basically, instead of adding a modifier like a stat to your rolls, you actually have uh, 12 tags when you start the game. Whenever you take an action, uh, you pick out the tags that are most relevant for that action. And uh, that is the number of tags that you can associate with the action is your modifier. So this kind of opened up a whole new world because tags can be... Uh, anything, you know, they can be obviously characteristics, powers, abilities, uh, gear, um, allies, resources, uh, attitudes, personality traits. There's a really no limit to to what tags can be. So that makes like people have tags like obviously strong and uh, I don't know, like if you're Don Quixote, you got you have maybe like a lance and things like that or a fa- phantasmal yes. lance that you can summon. But sometimes people also have things like um, witty remarks or, you know, lines like the more the merrier. And then your character is stronger when there's a bunch of people. This gives me a little bit of vibes towards the fate system. Yeah, definitely. Reminded a lot of people of fate. I played the setting using fate and that was one of the options. And I, I have to say that I don't understand fate very well. I have never really studied it. But the only thing that I felt when I played it, it was a little bit like up in the air, you know, you just it wasn't crunchy enough. So I wanted to find a balance between going completely hand wavy and, you know, going full on a crunchy system to something that was relatively rules light, but kind of felt meaty enough i don't know if you ever have you ever played fate did you have that feeling i haven't played fate i did make a character for a game that never happened <laughs> <laughs> and i've listened to some fate games played but yeah it, it is very open and it does uh seem like it's a lot less uh rule structured uh whereas opposed you said apocalypse world is very structured yeah so i think i think that middle ground is really an interesting place between the crunchiness and the role-playingness then i think that's actually a really good ground to occupy for a noir that, that was definitely what we were going for there 
Now, when you said tags, do I have actual tags like I can hold and I can put on my shirt or something like that? I want to actually put tags on it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, the CD Miss character sheet is actually made out of four cards. Each one of your cards is, is a theme, and you start with three power tags. There are also weakness tags that take away from your rolls, like it's a negative modifier. So yeah, of course, you can also print out a, a sheet that has the cards printed on it, but we actually have some really cool accessories for that. We also have kind of like tag or status cards, because during the game, there could be additional kind of tags flying around, like the MC can say, or the GM can say during the game, okay, you've just entered this um, fire, you know, exchanging shots with crooks in the alley, and it's very rainy. Here's a tag, rainy. And now if, mm. you know, if that tag helps you, you, it's going to boost your rolls. You know, if it hurts your actions, it's going to reduce femoral roll and so on and so forth. So we also have cards for that, you know, as you kind of like tags are flying around the table. Very nice. Yeah, I guess I should have asked more about like the, the layout of the game itself. Like when I'm playing, you know, what what kind of things do I have in front of you? You mentioned that there are cards. So do I, am, am I going to hold some cards or am I just going to let it all out on the table for people to see? Yeah, you can. It's definitely not a game where you want to be hiding anything. Your cards are really just your character sheet. Yeah, that's you can definitely keep them close to your chest, but it, it wouldn't necessarily do anything. And we also have uh, the in the starter set, we have these uh, folios for the pre-generated characters, and they each have their four card printed on this nice folio with some really cool art. You kind of look at it and you know a summary of the rules, stuff like that. Uh, that just helps people get into the into the game. Yeah, the, the the only thing I I don't want people to know is that I am Don Quixote. I think that I might want to try and hide that as much as you would just be attacked with with all sorts of windmills. Uh, exactly. If you can weaponize a windmill, that's a pretty good power, actually. Mm-hmm. It's just a, it's it's a windmill full of corpses, Nathan. <laughs> oh, it's an undead windmill. <laughs> no, it's just undead full, windmill. It's full corpse. I think that's a zombie card. windmill. No, <laughs> I think it's a card and. Cards Against Humanity, just a just a windmill full of corpses. <laughs> that, 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 does, that does sound like something that they would have put in that game. Um, yeah. Actually, oh the, the core book character is, uh, the core book kind of sample character is a uh, detect. sorry, he's a reporter for the City Herald um, based on Don Quixote. So he's this kind um, of a moody guy, romantic, obviously. And um, he's he has some really cool tags, but one of his uh, weakness tags that I really love is reality hurts. So he's actually, his defensive power is to summon this kind of like a, an armor that he dreams on, it dreams about, like a phantasmal or dream armor. And that's pretty effective against creatures of legend but when you're shot with uh when he specifically is shot with a, gu- a gun or just beat up like the old-fashioned way so it's not as effective because you know it's it's you know if you don't know the story don quixote is dreaming all of this it's not real and reality always kicks him in the butt so that's mm-hmm. kind of a feature of this character when we go back to the start like before it was really a game and you were you playing it and testing that out yeah. What kind of characters were you playing? When this was in playtesting, you mean when we just started out? Yeah, yeah. When you were just starting out, like what 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 were you playing? What were your favorite characters to play? Actually, they ended up being in our starter set. So we had a set of uh characters that we used in a, in our playtest that, that later became the starter set for City of Mist. And that's by the way, that's free. Anyone can download that on our website. So my favorite character was um, Declan Lestrange, or he had a different name in his original version, but he's this kind of a, like a, almost like a dream god, kind of Morpheus uh, sort of um, character. So he's able to dream new things into existence. He's in, in real life, or in, you know, in his ordinary life, he's a smuggler. He's this kind of a gunslinging art smuggler or um i guess antique smuggler so that was one of the characters i really liked another character that people really loved playing was flicker she had um more like time and space bending powers two of her themes is like hipster and hacker so she's basically people loved acting out the you know the little 
remarks and the way she talks, mm -hmm. the way she dresses. So um, that was another favorite character. Like a hackster. Is that is that how it's Hackster, uh, exactly. Hackster? Total, okay. total hackster. Yeah. Yeah. I'm way too cool for the internet. <laughs> yeah, I'm way too cool for anything that's happening in the game. And people just <laughs> love taking that position and annoying the hell out of the rest of the players, but uh, it's fun. <laughs> Seems legit. It's the yeah. cool thing to do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's so 2015. <laughs> totally. Internet. I like the Morpheus character. Do do I get a choice between pills? Do I have to choose between the blue pill? And the red pill? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are we living in their reality? <laughs> exactly. Actually, speaking, of Nathan asking about choices. Are there different types of character options, uh, or races, or archetypes, or classes, or anything like that in City of Mist? So City of Mist, in every character is built out of four themes that can be either legendary, called the uh, mythos themes or ordinary called logos themes and uh, you choose when you start the game how many are legendary and how many are ordinary so you can have three and one two and two or one and three and there are seven types of themes in each of those sides on each of those sides uh, so you can basically choose what to highlight in your character so for the mythos, legendary powers, we have Bastion, which is defensive, mobility, like all kinds of movement powers, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, on the logo side, your ordinary life, you can choose uh, to highlight a mission that you have, training that you've had, uh, defining event in your life, defining relationship, gear that you have. And uh, when you choose those themes, first of all, you have a theme book, which is like a questionnaire that helps you create your tags for that theme and secondly you're kind of defining what your character is about so it's not exactly classes but you basically when you create a character you pick out four of those theme types to the kind of fine tunes what your character is about so when uh when we get into the, like the aspects that you have in like your ordinary form and then in your like supernatural form when you were talking about kind of like moving from one to the other, do I have to start taking some of those away in uh, and, and gaining other ones in more like the supernatural form? Is is that kind of the yeah. aspect? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So you basically, uh, your themes are, you know, they each have an either a mystery that you have to investigate or an identity that you have to uphold. So let's say that you have a theme that you're one of the characters salamander also a favorite of mine he's a plumber who has the mythos of the salamander like this yes. kind of like creature of fire but also very connected to rain and water uh so he has this you know primordial lizard creature inside of him <laughs> and um he's but he has this um routine it's called a routine theme called you know just just to represent his job and the things he can do because of his job as a plumber and uh, one his identity on that theme is i need my job to survive so whenever a character does something to put their job in danger or something that goes against the statement that theme starts cracking and after a couple of times it cracks you lose it. You basically did not, you, know, you didn't do enough to save your job. You get fired or whatever. The story is kind of built around it. And um, you, instead, you get a legendary theme, a new theme, like something. Okay, the character, it's like, think, think comic books. The character got fired, but that kind of makes more space in her life or his life for new powers to emerge or the, or the, the trauma of it, you know, makes new powers emerge. So... You're always playing on that balance uh, between uh, legendary and ordinary. I was actually going to ask when you when you lose a theme and you gain a new one, how do you go about gaining a new one? Well, first of all, you pick out a new theme book or a new theme type for whatever it is you gain. And uh, at the beginning, the theme is called a nascent theme. So you only have one tag in the theme, but it kind of nascent themes kind of evolve faster so you don't spend a lot of time being depowered but it kind of lets you you don't have to like whip it all out all the details out and, and create all the tags on the spot just after your character had a major like event you can kind of do it gradually you don't have to do it in the middle of the game so you describe basically how these new powers appear 
or if you lost uh, a legendary uh, theme and you're gaining an ordinary one, you start describing how this new ordinary aspect in your life begins taking place. So maybe uh, the character, I don't know, learns to be a lawyer and they take a tag like that, or they start training in martial arts because of what happened. Uh, I don't know, let's say they lost their power in a fight with the super demigod, whatever, and uh, now they're, they, they still want to be relevant. So they, they take up martial arts classes. There's a lot of it in the core book about how to introduce those new um, new themes. Even when, even if you replace a theme like that, you actually get special points call, called evolution points for everything that you accumulated in the theme you lost. So you actually get to unlock greater things by losing themes. It was really important to create some kind of a mechanism that would encourage players to take those dramatic actions and get to those dramatic developments. Cool. So can I ever gain the same theme I had once back, for instance? Yeah, if you want to do that, you can definitely, you can, there's no limitation on that. Um, there is this, I guess, a place in the core book where we say, ask yourself if that's the most interesting thing you can do with this moment, but sometimes it is. So there's no limitation. Right. I foresee someone that's built like the Hulk and then loses their, uh, you know, super strength, angriness, power, whatever you want, their Hulk power. Yeah. And then they're like, man, I can't do anything I used to be able to do. I want to get that back. So they're actively trying to get it back or something, something, something like that. Yeah. There's one thing that's really important to note is that this whole losing and gaining uh, themes thing is completely in the hands of the player. It's not something that the MC uh, chooses. The player chooses when to say, Oh my God, I just, you know, completely ignored the fact that I'm working tomorrow morning. I'm going to mark crack. That's that's one of the progression bars of the deterioration of the theme. I'm going to mark crack on, on uh, my character because my character is actually, she just did something against my, my core, you know, identity. Or let's say that my mythos is calling me to explore something, a question like um, when, when is it? the right thing to use violence or something like that. And I ignore that question and I don't look into that. And so maybe I'm kind of letting go of my mythos because that's the whole thing about my mythos. So players really are in control. It's just a tool for the players to get more out of the characters. It was a big decision in game design because usually the GM is responsible for compelling the players into these things, but it's, it's just not that much fun um, when you're being forced into these things. So we kind of said, why won't the why shouldn't the players just manage their own uh, dramatic moments? And it's totally okay if one of the players doesn't want to doesn't want that. I mean, they just want to stay with their power set and build them up. That's fine. That's an option. Cool. No, I can I can totally get behind that. That it sounds really interesting. It sounds like it flows fairly easily from one thing to the next yeah that's at least what people report that's obviously my experience when i play with it but um yeah i think uh that's one of the strengths of the game it's just really like a very flowing game you don't stop a lot for any kinds of calculations and stuff like that uh the moves drive the story forward adding more complications and twists and turns yeah that was definitely the purpose or the thought behind building it I have heard you mention the term MC. I don't think I'm really just very familiar with that term. What does that mean? Yeah, that's just uh, the G the game master for um, Ap Apocalypse World. Master of Ceremonies. Master of Ceremonies. Okay. So like MC Hammer or any of those MC. MC. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not Escher, but, you know, the, the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So it's okay. basically the, the, the role of the um, GM. It's very much to drive things, but it's it's a little more host kind of thing. You know, there's a lot of, of the narrative or, or the agency or the narrative power is in the hands of the players. So um, I think that's why they chose that name. Is it the kind of thing that you prefer to use when you're talking about City of Mist? Or do you have a preference of what people call the person running the game? Oh, no, totally not. But we definitely had to choose one for the book when we're writing texts. And I felt that that was, you know, that was a good term. You know, it's not the game master. No one's mastering the game. <laughs> definitely. It's, it, we definitely 
right in the most explicit way that it's the most important role in the game because without the MC or the game master, you can't really play. But it's it's just something we had to choose from a technical perspective right. how to call this. So right, and and it kind of lends to the uh, to to its origins with like the powered by a <laughs> apocalypse sort of uh, exactly. narrative. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Me personally, I like to stick with uh, CM. Somebody's going to get that reference, but only somebody who follows like things I do personally. Doesn't matter. We were very happy to have Amit Moshe on the uh, program and uh, talk more about City of Mist, which, you know, I'm not personally familiar with, but my goodness, so many people keep talking to me about it. So being able to, uh, to learn all about the game was a real treat. When we return on the uh, next episode, we are going to be talking more about the current Kickstarter that he has going on for Knights of Pain Town, which is actually a story arc book for uh, City of Mist. But uh, do not wait until then. You can go right over to Kickstarter and look up City of Mist. You will find it. They've done a whole thing with that where you can get PDFs or hardcover copies of books. They have four different books. Uh, Knights of Pain Town, Shadows and Showdowns, which is uh, an expansion book, uh, the Player Guide, and the MC Toolkit. And you can basically uh, pick and choose how many of the books you would like uh, and if you would like some in PDF form or some in uh, hardcover form, uh, but the artwork is really great, you should go and check it out and uh, and see uh, if this is right for you. Or if you want to uh, check out some resource materials about City of Mist, go over to uh, cityofmist.co, uh, and over there they actually have a few free downloads so that you can kind of see the system, a few free cases. Uh, that are downloadable, you can uh, go and, and check those out, and then you can get a real feel for it yourself. So something else you can do that doesn't take uh, any investment uh, on the outset for you to, to look into. And also make sure to follow them on Twitter, at City of Mist RPG. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Delvcast.com, where we do a landing page basically for every single project that we work on. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of things over there in addition to the entire Delve library. You can also find episodes of Orbital, and you can find uh, my continuing free-to-play marathon on Attempting to Play. Uh, we're doing two videos a week for like the next two months, it feels like, and probably maybe more than that. I don't really know at this point. Uh, so you can find it all over on Delvecast.com. Uh, also, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to us on any podcast app that you happen to utilize, if you use any of them. And uh, also, make sure to check us out on Twitter. Uh, I am at Citanium, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. And also, if you happen to be on DelveCast.com, check out our Patreon. We have uh, redone it. It's not uh, the funny uh, tongue-in-cheek one I had up originally. Uh, it's actually with, like, real tears that have actual stuff attached to them now. And on that note, I would like to thank our shiny level sponsors, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dom Perry. Thank you so much for supporting the show. And also, uh, while we are going to be having another episode where we talk more about Knights of Pain Town with Amit Moshe, we are going to be airing that after something cool happens, and I want to mention it to you if you are interested. If you like watching live plays and live streams, uh, on August 13th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on twitch.tv slash encounter roleplay, they are going to be doing this uh, like exclusive playthrough of one of the scenarios from Knights of Pain Town. So uh, you can get to see some really, really good role players uh, play this game. You don't want to miss that, because you know Encounter Roleplay does some really great stuff, right? Of course you do. So check that out, because that's going to be airing before we actually uh, do the next episode. Now, it, even after that time, though, you, you could just go on and watch it anyway. But if you want to watch it live, August 13th, 8 p.m. Eastern. And with that said, I think I'm going to go try and uh, get out of this mist. It's a heavy fog. Feels more like a heavy fog. Anyway, until next time, thank you for joining us. And we're looking forward to seeing you next time when we delve even deeper into City of Mist. Goodbye.
we usually split them up because we talk so long to people and we like to do like 30 to 40 minutes like for an episode. I love that. Yeah, I think yeah. it's great. You delve, basically. As, we, do, we do. Yeah, we delve. As we, the name goes. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> got the joke. <laughs> this man's hired. <laughs> the what? The, what? the joke. It's, it's the entire premise of the name. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, we're gonna call it Delve, and he's like, why? I'm like, because we delve into all these topics, Nathan. He's yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. I can get behind it.